Hello, good afternoon. That was a really interesting panel. Thank you so much, uh, Mata. It's fantastic. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here in Mongolia this week and to be your moderator for this session towards green and inclusive trade. My name is Vanessa Erobogbo. I'm the chief of the green and inclusive value chain section at ITC. So let me start by setting the scene a bit. Climate change is an existential threat to people's lives and it's dramatically changing economic activity and trade. The World Meteorological Organization predicts a 66% chance that will breach the 1.5 degree threshold set by the Paris Agreement within the next four years. The statistics are alarming. This means even more heat waves and prolonged drought, damaging crops and reducing electricity production. This means more severe floods, like the one we saw last year that left a third of Pakistan underwater, devastated key export crops and put the country's food and economic security at risk. Rapid and far-reaching transitions across all sectors and across all systems are necessary to achieve deep and sustained emissions reductions and to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Equivalent efforts must be made to help businesses and communities adapt and build resilience to climate change. And trade and investment uh, policies are increasingly being utilized as tools to accelerate the green transition. Developing countries seeking to integrate into global value chains are increasingly expected to comply with sustainability requirements. But they're also seeking to see their practices recognized and valued as part of the solutions package. A just transition requires ensuring that these expanding linkages between trade and sustainability do not exclude and do not constrain developing countries and especially small businesses from engaging in international trade. As part of ITC's mission to bring prosperity, inclusiveness, and sustainability to developing countries, we're working to scale support for small business climate action. And internally, we also believe in walking the talk. And this is why we've been carbon neutral since 2018. This year, I'm really proud to say that we offset our annual residual carbon emissions by purchasing carbon credits generated by the Salkit wind farm right here in Mongolia. And this is an example of using a market mechanism to monetize a natural asset. We'll hear more such actions during the course of our conversation today. We have an incredible panel of distinguished speakers who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience from different country perspectives. We'll talk about trends, we'll talk about innovations, ideas, concerns, challenges, and most importantly, solutions for an inclusive and just transition. So stay with us the whole time and uh, join the conversation yourselves. Share your views about what you hear uh, this afternoon on social media. Tag at ITC News, hashtag WEDEF. Without further ado, let me warmly welcome uh, the panel to this stage. Mr. Raja Badrul Nizam is the Senior Director of Strategic Planning Trade, the Malaysian Trade Promotion Sea. Please join, join me on the stage. Mr. Vu Ba Fu is the Director General of Viet Trade, the Vietnamese Trade Promotion Agency. And Mr. Joseph Murabula is the Chief Executive Officer of the Kenya Climate Innovation Center. And Mr. Batku Idesh is from right here in Mongolia. He's the Director General of the Trade and Economic Cooperation Policy Department at the Ministry of Economy and Development of Mongolia. Thank you so much for the hospitality that we've had so far this week. Ms. Judith Arens is the Managing Director of the Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries of the Netherlands. And Ambassador Axel Nikes is the Ambassador and Head of Delegation of the European Union to Mongolia. Okay, let's go.
So we're going to have um, a few rounds of questions. And in the first round of questions, we're going to unpack what each organization is doing to support trade for just an inclusive transition. And I will start with Malaysia. Um, Raja, from the perspective of Malaysia, what are your major priorities regarding trade and sustainability? And how is Martrade, an organization that we know very well as being very dynamic, what are you doing to, um, to address these priorities? Uh, very good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for the uh, question. Also, I would like to thank um, the ITC for inviting uh, myself and Martrade to represent uh, Malaysia at this forum. Uh, in terms of sustainability, um, Malaysia has made great strides uh, in terms of preparing uh, the country at the national level to adopt these uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Since 2015, we have formed uh, this SDG um, Council chaired by the, highest, uh, the Prime Minister himself to ensure that all the 17 goals of SDG are being implemented at the national level. And um, also, we are, you know, we adopted a number of measures um, and targets. For example, by uh, 2050, Malaysia is aiming to have net zero carbon emissions. That's to fulfill our climate change obligations under the Paris Agreement, COP. And by um, 2050, also, 70% uh, of our energy source will become will be will be coming from renewables energy, so we are reducing carbon emissions gradually. Uh, even by 2025, we are targeting 31 percent of our energy mix are coming from renewable sources. So that's at the national level. Um, even uh, the security commissions today has announced uh, the mandatory uh, training for directors to ensure they understand the impact of sensibility on their companies and what kind of questions they address in order to improve uh, sensibility scorecard for their individual companies and so on. In terms of Martrade, at the organizational level, uh, we are the trade promotion agency for Malaysia. Um, we started to understand the importance of sensibility in terms of the impact of export market. Uh, many of our export markets, for example, the biggest top five markets like EU, United States, Japan, Australia, even New Zealand, even ASEAN like Vietnam and also Singapore, they are key markets for us. And they have started to introduce regulations requiring our exporters to fulfill uh, environmental uh, practices um, following SDG or ESG uh, regulations. Uh, for example, the EU has the deforestation regulations, the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, um, Germany have their uh, due diligence act, and other regulations and so on. Now, all these markets account for around 20% of our exports. If we don't prepare our exporters to understand the importance of, of you know, adopting sustainability practices, we may lose the market and we have a big impact on our exports. And our level also, we have approached sustainability in terms of three um, uh, approaches. Number one, we, we organize a safe campaign, which is sustainability uh, action values for exporters under Martrade. We organize a learning series under that. We organize an awareness series, and we organize a collaboration series. So there are two types of training programs they organize for our exporters under Martrade. So the awareness is to create greater awareness of the importance of sensibility for the exporters. The learning is about, you know, uh, working with stakeholders and equipping the exporters about the need on the understanding uh, of the importance or how to implement uh, policies or business practices to adopt sensibility, uh, you know, measures. And finally, cooperation with partners, agencies, and so on. That's the national level. And Finally, I'm going to be a bit too long, but I will cut short. Um, we have also an ESG hub. Basically, that's an online resource uh, we, uh, for SMEs to learn online about how to act, plan, and inspire um, 
sensibility efforts. It's online, so we have all the measures there. And finally, our ministry will, by September 2020, uh, launch the ESG uh, framework for manufacturing sector. So the SME can be guided and uh, have uh, access to guidelines on how to adopt sensibility practices uh, internally, domestically, and also to prepare themselves for the export market. Fantastic. A lot happening there. Very encouraging to hear about um, the targets. And, and what I took away from, from your uh, remarks was that you're placing a big focus on skills development, a big focus on, on training. Um, let's, let's move to Vietnam and see um, you know, what, what, what Vietnam is doing. We know that Viet Trade um, places a big emphasis on small and medium enterprises. Um, and that struck me as, as, I was curious to know why, why the focus on, on small um, businesses and what, what can we learn uh, from Viet Trade? Well, um, first of all, thank you, Vanessa, for the very nice question. And uh, on behalf of your trade, I am very proud to be here in this uh, very important and big floor. Uh, coming back to the SME of Vietnam, um, well, uh, the, around the world, we know that Vietnam, uh, talking about the climate change about Vietnam, we all know that Vietnam is along the top five countries. Uh, to be uh, affected uh, seriously uh, by the climate change in the future. So, uh, then many studies and research shows that Vietnam uh, SMEs of Vietnam will be the, the group uh, in the society to be the most uh, vulnerable groups uh, facing with the uh, the impacts of the climate change, so on the government side, we well aware that okay we need to do something. We need to guide to to instruct uh, the SME of Vietnam overcome the difficulties and also the 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 serious problem in the future. Um, and another element I would like to add that in Vietnam, the, uh, uh, to date, we have totally about uh, 800,000 uh, enterprises. But of that, we have 90% uh, of the total is an SMB and micro uh, SMB. So, uh, meanwhile, this, this group just contributes about 30% of the GDP. So we learned that the, uh, this group can contribute more and more for the GDP growth, GDP development in the near future, in the future. If we can support the SME to overcome the serious problem to be uh, facing in the near future of the climate change. Uh, so, uh, on the government side, we 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 uh, well aware that we have to do something with the SME. Then, um, we the governments already uh, adopt a serious kind of the, a very various kind of the strategies relevant to the green growth, green development, and green strategies and the laws. Um, for the periods from 20 to 30 and the vision to uh, 2050, the government uh, uh, in 2021 just launched uh, so-called the national strategies for the green development and transformation. Of that, the uh, SME and also the, uh, the, the entrepreneur, entrepreneurs is a central for uh, the government action. And based on that, government direct, uh, directed the relevant uh, agencies, uh, ministries and agencies and sector 
to compose uh, a series of the uh, so-called the uh, sectoral green developments and green transformation. And on the local size, local wide, the government asked provinces and city also to compose and launch the uh, plan of the, the so-called green and uh, green uh, development and transformation for the for the future, for the time to come in the future. Thank you very much also um, for, for those remarks. And uh, what struck me was 90%, 90% of businesses in Vietnam are small and medium enterprises. So that's a, a really important uh, stakeholder group to focus on. And I would like to um, continue uh, the discussion looking at the developing country perspective. So I'm going to move to, to you, Joseph, from Kenya, which um, I'm not sure if you know, but uh, in Africa, Kenya is known as a hotbed of tech, tech innovation. Um, but now Kenya is becoming a bit of a cooling chamber for the climate. And um, I'd like to, to, to know from you, Joseph, um, what exciting innovations are happening in Kenya? What can we learn from you about uh, incubating and supporting small businesses um, from the Center for Climate Innovation? <coughs> yeah, th thank you, Vanessa. Uh, I, hope, I hope you can hear me. Um, First of all, I'm from the Kenya Climate Innovation Center, and that is um, an incubator and an accelerator for small businesses. We take uh, businesses from the idea to, uh, to commercial stage, and then uh, get them to other funders to, to be able to continue. So to come to the specific question, in, in Kenya, generally the government has set uh, policies to ensure that we can move towards a climate smart uh, economy. Um, in terms of energy, for instance, the, the government has uh, committed to have a 100% uh, renewable energy mix by, by 2030. We are, probably, we are at over 90% at, at the moment. Uh, in terms of um, uh, cooking solutions, uh, we, the government has, uh, has set a pace to have 100% um, clean cooking solutions by, by 2028. Uh, uh, two years ago, in 2021, the government also set up the, um, the, what we call the Waste Management Bill, which has what, uh, what's known as the extended uh, producer principle. In other words, whoever pollutes uh, must basically pay for it. Um, there is uh, currently uh, re we are currently reviewing our climate change bill, mostly to add on to it the mechanisms around uh, carbon credits um, as, as a financing mechanism. And we already have um, a circularity principle to, to come, um, I mean, a circular economy uh, policy that is currently under debate by, by parliament. Now, all this is, um, is, is uh, bringing about innovation, and the Kenya Climate Innovation Center, of course, is at the center of that. So in terms of the sectors we support, uh, they are basically around five, uh, renewable energy, agriculture, waste management, water, and commercial forestry. So if you look at innovations around um, renewable energy, we are seeing a lot of uh, progress mostly around a uh, productive use of uh, of energy so we are supporting uh, currently supporting about four immobility e uh, organizations these are mostly these are mostly um uh, motorbike uh, companies which are now moving away from fossil fuels to use um, uh, renewable energy uh, there's still a bit of a challenge because the charging infrastructure is not uh, sufficient um, we, until about uh, a year ago, we had our first fully electric uh, motor company, the Nopea Rides. For those from Kenya, you would remember that. Unfortunately, it had to exit uh, the market because the market conditions were not, uh, were not right. Uh, we're also seeing quite a lot of um, uh, substitution 
mostly by solar substitution of this cell mostly by solar in, to 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 support agribusiness uh, and also using solar especially in remote areas to support things like um, health uh, things like education and basically just the provision of social services um, in terms of agriculture we are seeing quite a lot of um, upscaling up the value chain from primary agriculture to production um, and we basically uh, support support uh, all this all these innovations we are because of the shortage of land we are seeing a lot of um, uh, what we call urban farming solutions so farming above the ground uh, over the roof or uh, or uh, through hydroponics we support the largest uh, hydroponics company hydroponics africa it was incubated by ourselves uh, in terms of west uh, there's quite a lot of innovations around uh, conversion of waste into uh, organic fertilizer basically in support of agriculture uh, conversion of waste into uh, baskets uh, quite a lot of them are being sold uh, here in Asia uh, mostly in China and uh, and India and conversion of waste into uh, mobile chargers uh, uh, laptop chargers and that sort of thing uh, in terms of water, we are seeing quite a lot of um, a lot of uh, decentralized systems. So improved uh, water kiosks just to ensure that water, uh, clean water, can reach areas that it has not been able to reach uh, before. Uh, things like improved fertilizers. I mean, sorry, improved uh, filters, improved membranes, basically just to ensure that water can be able to reach everywhere and this is a uh, clean water so what do we learn out of all this uh, generally the first thing we learn is that there is no one solution to all each um, enterprise must be supported on its own and that is why uh, at kcic we do a lot of mentorship uh, because no enterprise is going to require the same solution as as um, as as the other uh, we dedicate a business analyst or a business advisor to every enterprise that we support just to ensure that they stay at support we also learn that uh, you generally to transform uh, these sectors and have uh, uh, support the fight against climate change we need committed government action uh, government must set policy uh, from which the private sector can then uh, take you we also uh, learn that ultimately um, innovation is going to to go ahead of regulation but and therefore there's need for continuous uh, dialogue between uh, government and the private sector uh, to ensure that the innovation is not stifled mm -hmm. and that there's an enabling environment for uh, for innovation and that's why things for PPPs, even PPPs for micro enterprises that we support, uh, become key. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, the biggest thing that stuck out to me was that Kenya plans to go 100% renewable by 2030, I think you said, and is already 90% renewables. And this is an economy that is, is growing really fast, so it can be done. Um, so far, we've heard about um, how countries are tackling issues around water, around waste, around energy. We've heard a little bit about market mechanisms to address um, climate change, um, the need for policies, skills, uh, innovation, dialogue, cooperation, um, and so for me, narrative is really important. I'm so happy sitting here right now, listening to all this, because I think it dispels the perception that developing countries aren't interested in sustainability, right? It dispels that notion. And yesterday, that notion was dispelled as well with the uh, youth entrepreneur. Uh, 
um, awards, which was really, really exciting. I'm not sure how many of you were here yesterday. So really, really exciting to hear um, about all this climate action happening on the ground. And now I'm going to uh, move to our host country, to Mongolia, to um, Batku, Director General, um, to talk a little bit about Mongolia's um, priorities um, in relation to sustainability. You already know that we, um, ITC, have, have benefited from the, the wind power uh, in Mongolia. So interested to hear a bit broadly what, what government's priorities are. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador Nikes, and fellow panelists from and all the audience from all uh, over the world. Good afternoon. It's my honor to sit among you. And uh, since our audience is from everywhere, I would like to give a brief uh, introduction on the Mongolian economic structure. Mongolia was a centrally planned and animal husbandry and agriculture and light industry based economy almost 30 years ago, 40 years ago. After transition to market economy, our economy changed, had a structural change. And now we can say that uh, our economy is heavily based on mining sector. You can see that uh, our uh, mining sector accounts for 25% of our GDP, and also it accounts for around 93% uh, of our export. And also you can say that 85% uh, of our export, including mining and non-mining sectors, uh, raw materials. So you can see what would be the government policy priority and challenges. So far, uh, we try to utilize our uh, uh, comparative advantage in a mining sector resource-rich country, as a resource-rich country. And I think we need to and must uh, excel in this area. But uh, I'm happy to say that uh, government is now giving priority and much more uh, attention to non-mining sector. Recently, we have approved a uh, government resolution that uh, we're going to prefer a draft law on non-mining sector export support within this year and also a policy focusing on the non-mining sector export support. And uh, as you know, we are a member of a World Trade Organization and under this uh, trade facilitation agreement, uh, we uh, have an obligation to introduce this uh, trade single window system before the end of 2025. But the government has a strong commitment to introduce and make it fully operational within 2024. And not waiting for these uh, actions, we also propose to uh, have uh, strong measures on, uh, on trade facilitation. For example, we would like to have uh, uh, improve the, all the customs uh, check uh, uh, procedures and uh, all the other uh, activities. And uh, our Minister of Economy and Development has a mandate to work on long and medium and short term uh, development policy uh, formulation. And uh, one document we recently approved and uh, got it ratified by the Parliament is the annual development plan for 2024. The first item or policy priority under this annual development plan is increase export. So you can see our policy priority is always export, especially non-mining sector export. So we would like to increase uh, investment in value-added processing in mining, both mining and non-mining sector. And also, I would like to say that together with ITC, we are working on a national export strategy. We had a first round of discussion with our stakeholders and domestically, and uh, during the next two days, we, would, we will have a second round of discussion. And I have a very big expectation on the result of this national export strategy. And we together with uh, identified some uh, potential areas to focus on. It includes uh, uh, renewable energy and ITC among the traditional sectors. So you can see that our government is giving priority to this sustainable 
digital and green trade trends. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, um, we're, we're really pleased to be working with uh, Mongolia on, on the national export strategy. And I, I would expect that there'd be um, some talk on, on sustainability and how, how that can be integrated. Um, the the, the uh, work that you're doing on, on trade facilitation and customs procedures will also be really important um, in the green transition. Uh, to support, you know, the, the smooth um, flow of, of, of green goods. Um, so, yes, really, really interesting. And, and one thing I took away from yesterday as well was um, the amazing innovation from uh, the Mongolian entrepreneur, the, the youth entrepreneur, uh, which was a great example of um, a climate adaptation um, initiative with the... the, the uh, air filtering uh, system. It was super interesting. Um, okay, so we, we move along to, to, to hear a bit more now from a, a consumer country, um, Judith. Um, CBI is a, a very um, special organization, plays a very special role in the trade landscape as an import promotion agency. Um, what's your contribution to fostering an inclusive transition? Thank you, Vanessa, for um, this introduction and giving me the floor. Um, and also, I think this is such an important uh, uh, subject, green, sustainable inclusiveness. So um, I really like to elaborate on this. Um, but first, perhaps it's good to say something about the history of CPI because for more than 52 years we've been working on, or we've been working with SMEs from developing countries how to enter and to overcome the barriers to enter the European market. Because everybody knows it's not an easy, it's not an easy job sometimes to get to the European market. The regulations are high, the standards are high, um, but also the uh, consumer and the buyer requirements are pretty high level often. So. That is a, a mandate we took from the CBI to overcome and to see what information on uh, programs we have to, um, to help overcome those barriers. Recently, we changed our strategy because we, as you mentioned in your introduction, it's uh, walking the talk. And we realized, uh, being a, a donor co uh, organization, that if we take the world and the transition, the sustainability and inclusiveness so seriously, we should put all our effort we have on these subjects. So we say it's not only about economic development, it's about economic and sustainable development, and we have to combine those together. That meant that we, um, we have, in fact, two products. I, think. I see it on the, on, the, on the screen already. One product is market intelligence. I don't know whether you know it. If you haven't, please make sure, and you are an SME or a BISO, here you can find, it's a platform of uh, qualitative market uh, research, sector analysis we make on several sectors. And um, it's not only about the trends in Europe, it's also about how to go green, what kind of certification is needed, where can you find the buyers. So it's a whole branch of information for SMEs who would like to enter the European market. Then we also work on capacity building in several countries in mainly Africa and Asia, unfortunately not Mongolia, but before we did on tourism, on sustainable tourism. And we've been working in Vietnam and uh, Malaysia before. Um, we uh, try also with SMEs to overcome the barriers to come to the European Union. But before we used export as a mean, and more and more we kind of, or as a goal in itself, and right now we see it as a pulling factor, really to come to a more sustainable uh, and sectoral change. And that means we on, don't only work with SMEs, but also with the whole ecosystem. And we look at where are the dots what are the things, what are the interventions, what are the cost roots, um, what are the root causes of the fact that the sector can't be uh, inclusive or sustainable? And together, 
in a program of four or five years with several stakeholders, we try to really make a step in a transition. Let me give you one example. In Sierra Leone and Liberia, we work with cocoa farmers. And in fact, their income was really low. Uh, and because of that, you had problems with deforestation, you had problems with youth or child labor, and sometimes even uh, women that had to work without any income. So together with the SMEs involved and also other parties, we looked at what are the dots in this system that we have to change. So we really changed, we trained the chain, the trade challenge, challenges, uh, ch channels, I should say, the trade channels. Um, and by doing that, so by doing really on a holistic and, or systemic way, we didn't work on individual cases, but we really looked at the sector. And right now, it's one of our success stories, in fact, because some really small farmers right now are uh, entering the European market and have their buyers on the highest standard chocolate makers in, the, in Europe. So they're, and they have a fair income right now. They have decent jobs uh, on, on the environmental issues uh, there have been tackled. So, but, you know, it's very easy to talk about sustainability and inclusiveness, but we also learn from TPI it's really hard to work. Not so much only for us, but especially for the people in the field, because there's so many issues to tackle. So I think we have to accept together that's a learning process, and we have to do it together. Um, but I personally believe we really have to put all our efforts in that sense, and um, that way I think it's the only way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. I couldn't agree with you more. It's hard work, um, it's a learning process. I think we don't have all the answers yet. I really liked what you said about combining the economic development and the sustainable development, because you know we, we can't just do export for the sake of export, but at the same time, we can't push uh, too hard on the sustainability dimension to the detriment of the economic dimension. So the two have to um, be carefully calibrated hand in hand. Right. So, Ambassador, we've heard um, a little bit about, you know, the um, regulations. Um, we've heard a few mentions of deforestation, of carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism, uh, look, at, you know, trying to um, lower, to, to decarbonize their economy. Um, new regulations aren't unique to the European Union. There are a number of, uh, of different countries um, bringing in new regulations. But we do know that Europe is moving ahead with a very ambitious uh, Green Deal. Would be great to hear from you how the European Union is supporting partner countries to ensure that um, the, the ambitious Green Deal isn't detrimental to people on the ground and to small enterprises in developing countries. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity maybe to wrap up all, you know, very inspiring uh, stories, example, experiences that were expressed uh, by the, the, the previous uh, speakers. I think the, the Green Deal is encompassing uh, many of the topics that, that were addressed. As is also a paradigm shift uh, for the European Union, as the ambition is to reach the European economy as sustainable, more circular, and totally carbon-free by 2050. And this is uh, in itself a considerable challenge. So to accompany this shift, there is, of course, a set of policies that, first of all, concern the EU member states, but very quickly I will go beyond the reach of the member states. Um, such policies, for instance, is a circular economy action plan, the farm to fork strategy, the EU biodiversity strategy, proposal on sustainable product regulator, regulation, also proposal to stop deforestation. We have uh, EU-Mongolia forest partnership in that respect, and uh, waste management, healthy soil, fit for 55, uh, because actually by already 2050, uh, 30, sorry, 2030, we have an engagement to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emission by 55%, and the carbon border adjustment mechanism. That just to name a few of those policies. 
So, as I said, it gives direction for our member states on the way to climate neutrality, but we can only achieve this through partnership uh, basically all around the world. Uh, and in this respect, uh, my second point is the trade policy, which obviously has a role uh, to play. So what do we do as EU concretely in promoting a sustainable trade practice that would in support inclusive and just transition? So an important focus is to ensure that the trade tools support the global transition toward a climate neutral economy. And for instance, this is achieved through accelerating investment in clean energy, promotion of value chain that are circular, responsible and sustainable. It also means to create opportunities for sustainable products and services to be traded more extensively. On this, I think we have two level uh, ground. First, of course, there is WTO that needs to be uh, definitely a key role. It's the priority for the EU is to see how the WTO is relevant to tackle global challenges, including protection of environment and addressing climate change. So, for instance, there are three uh, environmental initiatives in the WTO. The one on fossil fuel subsidies, another one on environmental sustainability, and the third one on plastic pollution. Those allow us globally, collectively, to advance on those topics. And we try, of course, to connect as much as possible with like-minded partners. But we can do more. The climate and sustainability agenda are essential component of a broader WTO reform. And we want to bring climate and environment consideration to the heart of the WTO through an increased transparency, dialogue, cooperation among the members. I wish to underline that the EU has shown tremendous, unprecedented transparency of the European Green Deal measures. And we really hope and plead that all WTO members would follow us on that path of transparency that would facilitate partnership and coordination of effort. Beyond the WTO, of course, bilaterally, the EU has a vast network of bilateral trade agreement that facilitates trade in green technologies, goods, services, investment. So those FTAs have ambitious sustainable development chapters. They also support the diffusion of clean and more efficient production methods and technologies. And they create access access opportunities for green goods and services. So besides the EU bilateral free trade agreement, we have also, for those countries we are not engaged yet in uh, a fully comprehensive and deep free trade agreement, we have the generalized scheme of preference that includes provision on environmental protection, but also on labor rights and social standards. For instance, Mongolia benefits from this specific trading regime with the general scheme of preferences, GSP+, which allow Mongolia to export two-thirds of its product to the European market with zero tariff. This is a very good instrument that has been so far largely untapped and underused. So I want just to finish this word saying that we are taking legislative step, and this is outside the Green Deal, to also eradicate child forced labor and promoting decent work and human uh, rights. So promoting decent work encompasses the support for workers affected by trade transition through retraining and reskilling program, but also the social protection to ensure that the workers are not left behind during this trade transition and the tremendous effort that uh, the green transition will take. In employment benefit, healthcare and pension schemes must be part of the picture. So to meet this ambition, the EU engage in dialogue with stakeholders, including with trade union, civil society, organization, and business to ensure a just transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Clearly, um, this is indeed an ambitious plan. Um, we can see that the European Union is using all levers at its disposal to drive sustainability. And I was very encouraged to hear um, uh, your statement on engaging in dialogue with multiple stakeholders. So that, that's, that's, that's really encouraging. So, so far we've had Malaysia, net zero by 2050. Vietnam, green strategies and laws. Kenya, 100% renewable by 2030. 
Mongolia, wind farms, innovation, Netherlands, systemic approaches, and of course the European Union, a broad raft of efforts across many different dimensions. So the unifying theme, the thread that cuts across each of these statements to me is that action is happening everywhere. Congratulations for that. I think in the next um, round of questions, um, I would like to focus a bit on, on joining the dots of all that action, the different actions that is, is happening everywhere, and um, ask a question on partnerships. Partnerships will be critical. Collaboration will be critical to face this big challenge. I think it was Bill Gates who said during uh, the pandemic a couple of years ago, he said that climate, the impact of climate change could be similar to experiencing a COVID-type pandemic every 10 years. Don't know about you, but I don't plan to, to, to have that myself. So we're going to need these partnerships to, to address this big challenge. And maybe let's uh, start again um, from, from you, Mr. Raja, on what type of partnerships do you think are needed? What do you think those partnerships should do? Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Um, one, one thing I want to address, which I probably missed out in my um, earlier explanation, and this is related to partnerships. Um, in Malaysia, we have already launched the National Trip uh, Blueprint. It's a five-year um, blueprint to, that provides the strategic directions and the priorities for trade um, to ensure uh, competitiveness of Malaysia for the next five years until 2025. So the National Trade Blueprint is the main document that brings together in a partnership model for all the private and public sector to work towards um, you know, increasing competitiveness of Malaysia's trade. And one of the key agenda, there are eight working groups under the National Trade Blueprint for five years, is on sustainability. So under this sustainability agenda, we bring in partners from the different ministries, uh, the banks, banks play an important role uh, in terms of providing financing for sustainability initiatives um, for SMEs, mostly for SMEs. We brought in the NGOs to help us you know, communicate the need for sustainability at all levels of the government. And also we have initiated the greening, uh, the greening export supply chain. But basically under the National Trade Blueprint, what we do is to encourage more of the companies, especially exporters, to start adopting um, you know, uh, environmental ESG principles uh, in their business practices so that they will be able to enhance their participation in the global supply chain. So you know, Malaysia as, as an important trading nation, 140% uh, of our GDP comes from trade. So we need to maintain a high level of uh, you know, um, policies and preparing our exporters towards um, sustainability efforts. Global partnership, we have worked closely with partners like DHL, uh, Standard Chartered Banks, we work closely with uh, HSBC banks, and these banks provide, um, together with us, provide thought leaderships on implementing or introducing uh, green financing for infrastructure, businesses, and so on. I think. Uh, we work across uh, more, the most, one of the most important elements of partnerships is to collaborate on a very equal level. Inclusiveness, covering all levels of society, women, youth, and um, you know, exporters, and also uh, in terms of creating regulations that facilitate um, export um, and meeting all the current regulations for export overseas. And finally, I think is uh, the private-public collaboration is so important uh, to realize any kind of policy that we have adopted um, towards increasing export business in the world. 
Thank you very much. And I'm going to move quickly to, um, to, to you, Fu from Vietnam. Um, what, 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 do, what, do you, what are your views on partnership? Yeah. So we talk about the we talk about the policy. We talk about already about the strategies, green the strategies of Vietnam. So now, okay, we go to the action. For the action, we have to rely on the partnership. Um, we in Vietnam, we uh, we are well aware that okay, talking about the partnership, we will have. Uh, the global international partnership and also the domestic partnership. For the international partnership, uh, we are uh, recently, we uh, do work uh, very closely with the uh, bilateral and also multilateral. For the multilateral, we work very closely with World Bank, with the ADB and other financial institution. We work very closely with the uh, WTO, with ITC, and other regional uh, institution, uh, technical institution. Uh, we work also very closely with the G7 group because Vietnam is among the uh, very few countries, developing countries, committed for the uh, net zero or uh, toward uh, 2050. So we hope that the, uh, the fund of the G7 group will support for these country to uh, uh, perform and also to implement the Greens uh, transformation. Uh, that's talking about the, the international partnership, but inside the country domestically, we, uh, uh, as I said before, that okay, we have an action plan for the uh, yeah, international, uh, for the national wide, for the pre pre uh, regional, local wide, and also sectoral wide. We work with the NGO, uh, with the public sector, and also private sector to realize and also to implement this um, action plan. Of that, we intensify and focus on raising awareness on the needs of uh, green transformation and sustainability. We work uh, and focus on the legal framework because, okay, once you have a very good awareness on the needs of the transform green transformation, you need a legal framework for the Okay, to implement the direction. So the government uh, have to consult the, the uh, NGO and also private sector to know that, okay, what the government need to do to regulate the policy and also the tools to encourage the uh, SME and also private sector to implement the green strategies for the years to come. And when we have a very suitable uh, legal framework, we need to have uh, also the capacity building and also technical assistance programs for the SME. Recently, the government own, uh, already uh, established uh, incubator and innovation center in the uh, uh, in the areas uh, in the sectoral and also in the provincial already um, already to form up the fund for the uh, green transformation of the SME already the government also asked the SM SBV I mean that okay state bank of Vietnam to to work with the commercial bank to form up and establish uh, a, a channel, so-called the green financial resources or green financial bank, a green financial uh, channel for the uh, green uh, transformation programs. Uh, about the retreats, what we do recently, the final, I th yeah, final yeah. about the, uh, the role of retreat in the green transformation 
we learn that okay if we just do nothing so in next five years even though that if we have uh, the products good products but we cannot export to the eu as uh, you just launch uh, many new regulation relevant to the green uh, criteria so that to deal with the sme we trade has concentrate on the raising awareness for the sme on the needs of the uh, transfer the green transformation and also we equip the information and the knowledge and also uh, about the new regulation on the on on the greens uh, requirement and green transformation and sustainability around the world especially in eu and also in us and in japan and so on okay. then we work which we work very closely with the ITC and about the Green Hub, about the WTO, uh, work with WTO and work with the other institution to uh, implement the various uh, series of the training for trainers Thank uh, programs. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. A lot happening there. And I'll come back, I'll circle back at the end just to try and capture a bit of all of this great stuff that's happening on the ground. Um, Ambassador Nikis, could I come to you to ask you um, what your views on the types of partnerships needed are? Thank you. Um, yes, obviously dialogue partnership are of paramount uh, importance. I think I would use a few qualificative uh, to speak about uh, partnership. First of all, given the global challenge is uh, evolving rapidly. I think, first of all, we have to be focused and the partnership must be strategic. In strategic, we mean by forging alliances with government, international organization, industry leader who can provide valuable insight, expertise and resource. And then by leverage our collective knowledge and experience, we can navigate the complexities of uh, the global challenges. So beyond being strategic, partnership have obviously to be inclusive. Um, trade should be not be confined to a few. It must be inclusive, empowering nations, regardless the size, the level of development. We have to actively engage and support developing countries, providing them with necessary tools, capacity building, market access opportunities. And then we can ensure that the benefits of global trade are shared equitably. So that's for the inclusiveness. And finally, we need also a transformative partnership because the challenge will require bold transformative action. We need partnerships that are willing to challenge the statu quo, to drive innovation, embrace sustainable practice. And in that respect, collaborating with private sector entities, research institutions, civil society, organizations can catalyze uh, the change. So through transformative partnership, we can shape a more resilient and responsible global trading system. Two last point, I think we shouldn't left out obviously the regional integration dimension. I mean, the EU itself, it's uh, an example of what we can achieve when uh, we team up around trade and economy. So through the regional integration, we can unlock the potential for untapped market to propose intra-regional trade and of course to create more opportunities for business and entrepreneurs. And finally, yes, we have to prioritize capacity building and knowledge sharing. By investing in human capital, we can empower individuals, business, nation to adapt to the evolving demands of the global marketplace. So enshrine in, in uh, all those key words that I was enumerating um, and, and to conclude, I think uh, our new strategy, the EU Global Gateway Strategy, is an extremely ambitious plan, but it aims to strengthen those partnerships along the line of prosperity, stability, and resilience um, around the world with key partners, but also uh, with all partners. And for this, we have set in motion some specific uh, instruments. For instance, just to give an example, the development of new way of financing through the European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus, the EFSD Plus, 
where we can provide grants and guarantees to HIFIs and then to entice them in return to invest with the beneficiary countries in green development. So I think through the global gateway strategy, we can establish us as a partner of choice for achieving green, fair, inclusive development. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's really interesting. From where I'm sitting, I can see this common thread coming through and I'll come back to it at the end. Joseph, um, if I can ask you to be somewhat brief, um, I see some hungry people uh, looking back at us. So if I can ask you to, to be brief and we'll, we'll try and, and wrap up on time. <coughs> yeah, th thanks, thanks for that. The, um, at, at KCIC, we use what we call a whole ecosystem approach, and that means we have great partners at every level. Yeah, uh, I'll say that at KCIC, we use an ecosystem approach, and that means we have to get partners at every uh, level. Um, and these partners are the ones who made us successful. Uh, I must say that we have a commercialization rate of about 67%. That means uh, if you go to Kenya today, you'll find more than 2,500 enterprises which began as ideas within KCAC. Uh, in terms of partnerships, we generally categorize partnerships into four. Uh, the first is what we call technical partnerships. These are people who help us with co-creation of uh, programs, uh, people who help us with product development, people who help us with standards and, and that sort of thing. We have uh, an ongoing agreement with the Kenya Industrial and Research, Development, Research and Development Institute, KIRDI, who, who support our, uh, our clients in terms of product development. So once we onboard them, we take them to KIRDI so that then their products can be uh, fully developed. We also have an agreement with the Kenya Bureau of Standards, so which ensures that our, our, the products of our clients are market ready. Uh, then the second form of partnerships we have is what we call uh, knowledge partnerships. These are mostly universities that help us identify new innovations because they come in through uh, their students. Um, those from Kenya, you would know that in the course of last year, we did a challenge where universities around Kenya brought their students to compete on uh, what we call the climate launchpad. And the, um, the one who won at KCIC level or at Kenya level, went on to win at Africa level and then went on to win uh, at global level. Uh, that's a, an organization called Ecobana. He won a million dollars and currently he's building a factory to manufacture uh, sanitary parts out of uh, banana fiber. So basically what that means is that the universities have been very uh, useful partners for purposes of identifying a new um, new innovations. The second, of course, I mean, the third is what we call policy, policy partnerships. Uh, these are associations through which we work in order to influence policy. So things like uh, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, the Association of Small Businesses uh, uh, in Kenya, uh, the Kenya Renewable Energy Agency. We are, we are in all this basically to create an enabling environment and then finally, you cannot move away from uh, funding partnerships. Uh, these are the people who give us money to be able to fund this enterprise. I think you would know that the EU currently is one of our largest partners. They fund one of our largest programs, mostly around uh, agriculture. So we have funding partnerships both at uh, donor level and what we call follow-on funding. People who fund our enterprises once they have been incubated to commercial level. So thank you. Thank you. Super, super, super. Uh, Judith, give us a sense of, of, of your views on, on the partnerships. Partnership. Well, thank you. It's a huge question, and you ask it right now, but the audiences are hungry. Um, and I think it's a good part of partnership is that you listen well to your partner. So I really try to, <laughs> try to be brief and structure myself a little. But partnership um, from our field point of view is, I think, first of all, business to business business to government, government to government, and that on a national, regional, international level, bilateral and multilateral. So that's huge. Um, from our uh, way of looking, what we know from CBI is that the co-creation between uh, the AU importers and SMEs in developing country 
can really foster and, and make a step in sustainable development. So I think that's a way of partnership that we have to work on and whether it's circular uh, economy or other models, we really can learn and uh, help each other in that way. Second um, way of partnership is of course the donor uh, alliance. We had this discussion this morning uh, also with you, uh, with several partners here. Um, because we have to make sure that what we do, it's aligned and we um, we don't do each other on our, our island uh, on itself. So with ITC, we work on the CSR e-learning. I think it's a really good example how we can uh, work together, but other, also with other donors uh, uh, on the design and in the field who have to cooperate. And lastly, I think that's in, in fact uh, really when you want to foster sustainable economy, I think was one of the most important one. Before I worked at the climate uh, agreement in the Netherlands, really to execute uh, all the programs. And what we learned is that it's not only about money, it's not only about technology, it's about connecting the dots. And if you have the connection on the willing, the people that really want to make this new step and they start to trust each other and listen to each other, then you get info innovation and you get a new movement and I think that's a very important um, part of partnership. Thank you very much and let's round it up with our host country again, Baku, okay. over to you. Uh, thank you Anissa. I think that the uh, partnership or cooperation has many aspects and levels and I totally agree with you Judith and I, I'm glad that I heard many good ideas on this uh, how to evolve this partnership. And uh, let me uh, discuss about uh, one important issue. First day of our this uh, event was the landlocked the developing countries business uh, discussion. So Mongolia, like other landlocked developing country, has a very big uh, challenge to how to access the markets. And it's very important to have a good understanding and partnership with the transit countries. And uh, Mongolia had uh, built uh, several hundred kilometers of railways and paved roads to our border crossing points. And we are closely working with our neighboring country, with uh, PRC, to connect it to the, uh, their railway and uh, through that uh, to the other countries. So, uh, as we all know, the main uh, players of uh, trade is the uh, private sector. The government's main uh, role or uh, obligation is to uh, uh, create an enabling environment and make access to markets and uh, access to finance, etc. So, in terms of that, uh, Mongolia is working with the other uh, governments to uh, create uh, access to markets. Thank you, EU, for GSB class and geography. Uh, indication and also we have an EPA with Japanese government and now currently working with Korean government to build a, a sign a EPA and also we are considering other trade agreements and in addition to that uh, uh, we today this, uh, during this breakfast we discussed uh, with our development partners and diplomatic missions how to uh, coordinate and organize and uh, support each other. And uh, I think that uh, in order to successfully implement any kind of policy or strategy, they're like uh, playing the puzzles. All those puzzles need to uh, fit together very well. And, and then there comes that uh, uh, our support from development partners and all those NGOs and agencies and land ministries and mainly, uh, or the most important thing is the active engagement of the private sector companies, exporters, and, and also the NGOs. So <laughs> I totally agree with you. We need to utilize all of these possibilities mm -hmm. of the partnership and the co uh, cooperation. Thank you, thank you very much. So what, what would I take away from that? Um, diverse range of partnerships um, are needed. There were a, a lot of common threads indeed. Um, starting from the back, partnerships should be strategic, and uh, which is something that the ambassador mentioned. 
And then, um, Baku, you picked that up when you um, mentioned the partnerships with um, transit countries. So this is a, an example of making strategic partnerships. Um, partnerships that are needed should be participatory and inclusive. They should be transformative. I heard a lot about partnering on finance with financial institutions as well as with, with other um, financing mechanisms. Um, regional integration came up as something really important. And actually, one thing that I think almost all of you mentioned was capacity building, knowledge sharing, skills, um, partnerships. So really, really interesting to see so much action happening in so many different places, and yet so many common um, threads across all the, the remarks. Okay, now I'm going to give you a choice as uh, participants, as the audience. It's up to you if we break now and go eat, or if there's going to be one winner out of you who gets to ask one question. And I see a winner over there, the lady, I think Opewemi, would like to ask a question, and then we'll wrap up the panel. Thank you very much, and apologies for keeping you all away from lunch. So my question- So it really, wasn't our fault? No, not your fault, sorry. My question really goes to the EU um, and to the uh, Ex Our Excellency. Um, given the fact that the EU market is quite a very strategic one for many developing countries, um, there's been a bit of um, uncertainty uh, in the trade space on the implications of the CBAM. And I know that you mentioned it in your conversation. Is the EU uh, paying attention to the potential impact that that uh, new procedural rule, which is coming into effect by the 1st of October, would have on imports from developing countries. And to back up what Vanessa said about just transitions, um, many of these countries just might not have the capacity to comply with that regulation. And it then becomes another barrier to trade for many exporters from developing countries. So what is the EU's, uh, what is the plan uh, to fast track? And this has to be something so that there is no break in exports that's coming into the EU. Uh, to fast track support to those exporters from the developing countries into the EU whose exports would be impacted by the application of this rule by the 1st of October. And um, it would be really useful and helpful to know what the thinking is on how this support can be provided. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, I think you, you are really uh, taking what was perhaps absent in my intervention, because I speak about the Green Deal, which is overarching policy, the global gateway, the global challenges, but obviously there is not one solution that fits all, and access to EU market is, let's phrase it, also very challenging. And we have also rules such as consumer protection or, or make us sometimes difficult and complicated for the exporter. And I think that definitely there is not one solution that fits for all. And this paradigm can be only settled through dialogue to engage with our, I cannot tell you exactly which initiatives will be taken as of the 1st of October, because there will be various different case, different situation. But one thing for sure is that we are engaged with our interlocutors through dialogue. I was mentioning, of course, a government dialogue, structured dialogue, but also outreaching civil society organization. We are very keen on labor rights, on, on the protection at the workplace, uh, standards. We are also engaged with trade union discussion. So just to take an example, with Mongolia, for instance, we have a selective subgroup committee discussing on trade and commercial issue. So I think that those challenges can only be addressed through a dialogue and a focused dialogue. We need to listen and to understand for our partners to understand what are the reasoning behind these roles and also for us to better address 
what are the challenges and how we can address it all together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very, very much for being such an engaged audience. I could see uh, you listening intently into the conversation. Um, it's clear that we need to take urgent, urgent action. Um, it's clear that it's hard, it's complex, it's not going to be easy, it's a journey. Um, but it's also very clear and very encouraging that action is being taken across the world in different ways and um, that, you know, we, we're dialoguing, we're trying all our efforts to, to join those dots on, on addressing the big challenge that is climate change. Thank you very much to my distinguished panel of speakers. It was really a pleasure uh, sitting here with you and engaging in this very important conversation. With that, I hand the floor back over to my colleagues. Um, are there any announcements, Sibylla? Or Okay, thank you very, very much. Let's give the panelists a round of applause. Give yourselves a round of applause as well. Thank you.